Namaste, I am Raj Vedam and in this series of talks, I would like to present to you Indian knowledge systems and specifically the historicity of Indian knowledge systems. So in this series of talks, I have designed it so that first I will talk to you about the problems in the historiography of India and from there what impact that narrative has on our knowledge systems and having said that, I will give a brief idea of the kind of work I have been doing on Indian knowledge, on, on, on antiquity of the Indian civilization. And from there, I will talk to you about astronomy, Indian astronomy, I will talk to you about Indian mathematics, I will talk to you about Indian medicine. And after that, we will go to the historicity, the tra historical tradition of the Indian knowledge systems. So these series of lectures hopefully will give a rounded idea about uh, the Indian civilization itself. So before I start, Om Shri Gurubhyo Namaha, my pronouns to our gurus and many teachers who have taught us over the ages. So to set the context right, we will start with talking about the unsatisfactory historiography of India. So we have many problems in the narrative of Indian history today. We have what I call an enforced narrative of history and in contrast to that, we have got something that looks like an evidence-based history. So we are told, enforced by people like NCRT, enforced by the government of India, enforced in the media, movies and things of that nature, they tell us that we are a recent civilization. But our evidence shows that Bharatiya people are an ancient civilization. They tell us that there was an Aryan invasion or migration to India in 1500 BCE, but we can show that we are indigenous people for the longest time. We are not Aryans, Dravidians, tribals, we are an indigenous people. They tell us that knowledge systems developed in India with input from Babylon, Greece and all these old civilizations. But we can show that Indian knowledge systems developed independently and in fact impacted these other civilizations too. They tell us in this enforced narrative that we have aggressive, uncivilized, inhumane philosophies. But we can show that what we have in Vedanta is humane, enlightened philosophies. And they finally tell us that all other civilizations have impacted Indian knowledge systems, but we can show that Indian knowledge systems impacted other civilizations. So clearly, we are seeing at the very top level two sets of claims. One set of claim coming from the enforced narrative telling us all of these things about the Indian civilization, whereas I as a scientist and engineer have worked for many, many years examining the evidence from multiple disciplines and my research is showing something completely contrary to whatever has been enforced into our minds by NCRT and by other textbooks over the years. So bear with me and we will talk about this. So first, I would like to talk to you about historiography. Who are the people who wrote the history of India? Indians have been very happy with the concept of history that we have. We talk about Itihasas, Puranas, Talapuranas, Epigraphy or the genealogy of families. This has been our notion of history. We have been very happy with it. But when the colonial people, when they came and they were trying to rule Indians, they wanted to write a history of India that suits their purposes. They wanted to show that Indians are backward, primitive, superstitious, stagnant society and the British are forward. They are progressive, technologically advanced society. So they wrote history of India in a certain way to put down the Bharatiya civilization. They were followed by Eurocentric people. They, the, those scholars wanted to uh, address why are Sanskrit, Latin and Greek related? They found the relationships between Sanskrit, Latin and Greek and they wanted to address why this uh, relationship between these languages. And so to address those questions, they came about with several ideas that are Eurocentric in, uh, in notion and uh, they came with certain narratives. Wherever the colonial people went, the missionaries also were not far behind. So the missionaries wanted to convert Indians into Christianity. So they were at the forefront of translating Indian works, the Sanskrit works on Puranas, on the Itihasas, Upanishads and other things. They were trying to translate them into European languages. And their translations also were in a motivated in a certain way to make Indians look primitive, backward and so on. Since 1947, very unfortunately, we have inherited Nehruvian socialism. Socialism believes that uh, uh, the old order is corrupted 
and we, change can come on the back of uh, civilized uh, on, on the constitution for example if you have constitutional means bring in laws to restrict the old order and by destroying the old order they believe that change can come about so nehruvian socialism came with socialist ideas in the academia since 1947 since 1972 the marxists have been controlling the education sector in india so they believe all of history is a history of class conflicts oppressor oppressed that is all all your vedanta is gone philosophy is gone everything is reduced to oppressor oppressed who oppressed whom who is a victim here and all of those kind of narratives are what is come in the marxist narrative so they too believe that uh, we can bring in a classless utopia according to them by destroying the old order old order in india is hinduism so by destroying hinduism they believe that they can get a classless utopia so th- these five frameworks the colonial eurocentric missionary socialist and the marxist they have hijacked the history of india imposed their ideologies on that and led to a subversion of our identity in the present in the present times none of us can recognize who we are who our ancestors are in the narratives they say on who we are because that is that's how much they have corrupted the narrator so it's critically important to understand that these frameworks are the ones that control the historiography of india and these corruptions have happened over 300 years colonial scholars missionaries eurocentric scholars and what i call colonial hegemony people like portuguese dutch french british hand in hand with christian imperialism people like caldwell geo pope and others hand in hand with uh, eurocentric scholars people like max muller herbert risley and so on so they have come about with certain convergent ideologies and have come about the notion of aryan invasion or migration to india in 1500 bce so the convergent ideas have resulted in things like that and if you think that these are relics of the past unfortunately for our academia this is a received wisdom colonial ideas are received wisdom additionally they put outsider sociology on india and they use these sociological concepts that are relevant for the western experience they have imported that into india the angry white male of the west has become the angry brahmin male in india however ill fitting those models are but they use these failed models to talk about the indian context though our historical experience is not the same as western experience so anyway the uh, leftist leaning socialist academia and the marxist academia they work with archaeology today and with genetics where results are made to align with linguistics chronology and once again with circular dependencies questionable assumptions it directly impacts the bharatiya identity who we are as a civilization who are we as a people all that is impacted by these narratives so at a very high level these outsider frameworks colonial eurocentric missionary socialist academy and marxist they work with these primary ideas the first three work with the idea that christianity is the only true religion and uh, superiority of white europeans the last two frameworks believe by destroying hinduism we can get a classless utopian society and in the meantime they have shared interest to sh- uphold bible chronology show hindus as primitive backward stagnant superstitious discriminatory show superiority of white europeans promoting christianity history from below subaltern oppressor oppressed conflict dynamics show class conflicts claim victimhood all these are the common ideologies which they find resonance with and so they are strange bedfellows but they work together to make this happen and in, in tamil nadu we have the unfortunate dravidianism a deregenerated framework that also shares similar ideas they believe that uh, the dravidian people are not hindus and they show the hindus are aryans uh, backward primitive and these kinds of things they work to promote christianity and they claim victimhood today we have had from the west left to left uh, islamism and wokeism these these constructs also uh, frameworks also have a bearing in today's discourse and they too in india want to show hindus as primitive backward stagnant they want to amplify the voices from below subaltern and to claim victimhood everybody wants to be a victim in wokeism so these are the kind of frameworks their motivations to control the identity of the bharatiya person it continues to the present day and we need to understand this if we have to understand anything that we are doing 
So you might wonder, why am I talking about all this in a talk on uh, Indian knowledge systems? It's very important because the spurious narrative, Aryan invasion, this fake narrative says Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE. They say these nomads, illiterate nomads, they didn't even have a script, right? So they were illiterate, they just had oral tradition, no script. These illiterate nomads from Central Asia, they destroyed the superior Harappa civilization and they were running around in northern India with cow, curry, caste and all these kind of things. And according to NCRT text, India had to wait for thousand years for civilization to return to Magadha after they made contact with the Greeks. Once Magadha made contact with the Greeks in 300 BCE, suddenly we got the Brahmi script, suddenly we have Ashokan edicts and things like that, and we became civilized overnight. And then they say, your civilization is a young one, you have not had enough time for knowledge generation in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, so if you've got advanced knowledge in these areas, you must have learned it from the older civilizations like the Greeks, Babylonians, etc. So this is what they say. So they tell us that Aryans brought Sanskrit from Central Asia into India. The script Brahmi came from the Semitic script Aramaic from Israel, Levant into India. They tell us that astronomy came from Babylon into India. They tell us that the Greeks taught us math and sciences. They tell us that Turkic Muslims, they taught us culture, cuisine, architecture, music and civilization. And they tell us the British, they got us science, technology and rational thought. Some people even say Bhakti was taught to us by St. Thomas, who landed in Kerala. So these are the kind of claims that are made on the Indian civilization. So we see there is a denial of agency. We are not allowed to talk about our own history. The minute we say that, we are pigeonholed by them as Hindutva, Saffron, and all these kind of ideas because they don't want to deal with the evidence. They don't want to deal with the truths that we are uncovering over here. But bottom line, this is what their narration of history has led to a gross distortion of identity and growing divisive forces today in India based on spurious ideologies. I call it a criminal distortion of the history of the Indian civilization. Many people ideally should be behind bars for what they have done since 1947 till the present day in corrupting the Indian mind on who they are by masking the reality and presenting this uh, notion of history. They have to be behind bars. But in, in an enlightened civilization, that's what we would do. They have uh, distorted all aspects of our civilization, anchor points of chronology, and every aspect of Indian knowledge systems and identity. So I hope with this you have a background to understand how when we talk about Indian knowledge systems, we have to keep in mind these present day narratives because the present day narratives will deny you your knowledge systems. And I have been working on rebutting this kind of nonsense from Marxists, from socialists and colonialists and others for the last 15 years or 20 years. And I make use of published evidence in scientific papers and journals and I bring an evidence-based history, rational, logical analysis of models, data, methods, frameworks, and claims. And I show that there is so much of data for history in India. Anywhere you go, anything you take, whether it's genetics, climate records, archaeology, paleontology, botany, astronomy, oral records, religion, sciences, so much of data is there in the Indian civilization. And we can take this data and we can use various models that have been proposed, things like linguistic model, archaeology model, genetics model, astronomy model. And using this, we can try to explain the Indian context multidimensionally. So that is what we are doing. We are taking, we are understanding what assumptions are there in each model, where the data came for their studies, what methodology they have used. So we are going to look at uh, several things, the assumptions they have used in each of these models the kind of data they've used, the provenance of the data, where did it come from. We're going to look at the methodology in those models, what kind of methodology they've used, whether they're best in class or are they questionable. And we're going to look at the inferences and claims. So we're going to have a logical, rational understanding of the Indian civilization. But in general, what I do is I examine the, uh, I'm pioneering a model-based analysis of hysteriography, where I'm taking a uh, Vaisheshika kind of approach where we have a perception and inference, pratyaksha anumana, 
trying to understand Indian civilization on that, that basis, on a causal basis, trying to look at the linguistic model, textual model, archaeological model. So I have been pioneering a model-based analysis of historiography using linguistics, textual models, archaeological models, genetic, astronomy, southern models. Everywhere I'm looking for evidence-based narrative of the Indian civilization. And that is my methodology that I follow over here. I take a look at the data. Data can be either high quality data, medium quality data, low quality data. And I'm looking for a three-tiered investigation of Indian knowledge systems transmission, either contact through migrations, trade, invasions, evidence of transmitters of Indian knowledge systems through their works, evidence of use of Indian knowledge systems in foreign civilizations. And we show many, many uh, transmission methods. So in my rebuttal to enforce historiography, this is what I show from all of my evidence-based rational examination of facts. I show in the textual evidence, there is no memory of invasion or migration in any time frame. Whether you take works from Northern India, from Southern India, any time frame, nobody here is saying that we came from Central Asia into India, we crossed the mountains and came here. Nobody is saying that we drove the people from the north to the south. In the south, nobody is saying we used to live in the north and we were chased to the south. Nobody is saying we are Aryans, they are Dravidians. Nobody is saying we are North Indians, they are South Indians. Such kind of memory is simply not there in any Indian work, any period of time. So this is the first thing that we see. Common sense in our own texts don't have memory. Second, archaeology. In archaeology, they say, if a foreign culture has come into a, a place, we must see changes in the ceramic record, in the pottery record. Maybe a new technology has come in, a new style has come in. So we can try to see in 1500 BCE or so, are there any changes in the ceramic record? But in India, there's absolutely no change. Some people have said OCP, ochre colored pottery. That is an indicative of Aryans coming into India in 1500 BC. But then ochre colored pottery is there from 3rd millennium BC itself in India, showing a continuity. It is not something that Aryans brought in. Then if you look at genetics, so much of work has been done in genetics using fixation index, using PCA studies, using admixture studies, using uh, either maternal mitochondria or the Y chromosome or genome-wide analysis. Whole lot of studies have been done. And in my perspective, there still is no discernible markers in the genetic record that conclusively prove there is a foreign admixture of genes to the extent that they are describing Aryan invasion. It is simply not there in the genetic record. The genetic record says all present-day Indians cannot be clustered into North Indian pool, South Indian pool, Brahmin gene, Kshatriya gene, Vaishya gene, Aryan, Dravidian. We cannot divide the Indian population based on our genetics. That is what the genetics is telling us. We are all so thoroughly mixed that there is no way you can cluster into these buckets. In climatology, we know that there was a 200-year monsoon failure in 200 BCE that resulted in outward migration from India to the Fertile Crescent, taking a lot of Indian knowledge systems with them. We also know from geology and hydrology that there was a powerful Saraswati River that flowed from the Himalayas down to the ocean. And this river because of uh, plate tectonics movements uh, in the northern, northern India, some of the uh, tributaries like Sutlej that used to feed into Saraswati stopped feeding Saraswati and feed Indus instead now. And Yamuna that used to feed into Saraswati also changed course and stopped feeding Saraswati. Saraswati then dried up and we know from hydrology this drying up happened by 1900 BCE. But then how can the Aryans, supposed Aryans, invade India in 1500 BC, write the Rig Veda in India, and talk about powerful Saraswati River flowing from mountains to the ocean. How is that possible? That river doesn't even exist by the time the supposed Aryans have come. So this also is an indicator that Rig Veda is talking about Saraswati River that is very ancient, indicating even before uh, Aryans, supposed Aryans had come. In astronomy, there is so much of astronomy in several of our texts our Upanishads, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, all these works, Itihasas, they're all showing astronomical observations. 
Today, we can take those astronomical observations and with science, try to answer when were these observations made using the phenomenon of precision, for example, and they indicate great antiquity. Some of the uh, archaeoastronomical observations in Rig Veda, for example, the story of Aditi, that can be dated to 6000 BCE. The story of Ashwinis, that can be dated to 7200 BCE. The Kali Yuga, 3102 BCE. So this way we have got many, many uh, astronomy indicators that have got great antiquity. And you, one, must, one must ask, how is it that the Vedic literature supposed to be written after 1200 BCE in India, but has got memory of events going back thousands of years prior to that? So collectively, I show that by taking this multidisciplinary evidence, we can have a rebuttal to NCRT style enforced historiography and say that that is completely wrong what we're teaching our children. The evidence is showing something else. We can, we can, we can show that with evidence and rational examination of facts. All right, with that big background, we can now go to Indian knowledge systems itself where we, I would like to take up several areas. The first area of Indian knowledge systems I like to talk about is Indian astronomy, which we call Jyotisha, Jyotisha Shastra. We have had such a long timeline of discovery, innovations by various scientists in India over thousands of years. So I'd like to document some of those things in this talk over here. So briefly, I'd like to give you a span of astronomy works. I'd like to talk to you about sources and texts, various sources and texts. We know that we have got texts from ancient times. For example, Vedas and Brahmanas contain astronomy content. We have Puranas that contain stories with astronomy wisdom as metaphors. We can show all of these things. Then we have got Siddhanta. Siddhantas are mathematical astronomy works with mathematics and astronomy. So many of them like Vyasa, Atri Siddhanta, Parashara Siddhanta, Kashyapa, Narada, Gargya, all these works are lost. We don't have these texts anymore, but we know they existed because of citation to them by later writers. Therefore, we know that such mathematical works existed in the past, but we don't have them. Then Vedanga Jyotisha, we can date it to 1400 BCE, and the person Lagada, he was the author of this work. Then works by Vriddhi Garga, works Suri Siddhanta, we don't know the date for these works. Then several other lost works, Paitama Siddhanta, Romaka Siddhanta, Pulisa Siddhanta, Vashishta Siddhanta. We don't have these works today because they're lost. But Varamira, he left commentaries of them in find at current era. So we know what they contained. Going on, from ancient to 1000 current era, from ancient to 1000 current era, we have got, for example, Aryabhata the first around 476 current era, who wrote Aryabhatiyam, Arya Siddhanta, Varamira, who wrote uh, Pancha Siddhantika. We have got uh, Bhaskara I in 600 current era, who wrote the Bhashya on Aryabhatiyam. Now, Aryabhata's works are so terse that you need somebody with a PhD on uh, writing a PhD thesis on Aryabhatiyam. That's what Bhaskara did in his Bhashya on Aryabhatiyam. Brahmagupta, who wrote Brahmasputta Siddhanta, Bhateshwara, who wrote in 880 current era this, this Siddhanta, Manjula in 932, who wrote this work, a second Aryabhata in 950 current era, who wrote Maha Siddhanta, then from 1000 current era to 1900 current era, we got Bhaskara II in Ujjain, who wrote the famous Siddhanta Shiromani, then going on to Kerala School of Mathematics, Parameshwara in 1400 current era, who wrote these works, Nilakanta Sumayaji, who wrote uh, Tantra Sangraha, then Ganesh Daivigna and uh, Jeshta Deva, who wrote Yukti Basha. Then going on to Odisha, Chandrasekhar Samantha, who wrote Siddhanta Darpana, and several others. So what I've shown here is a continuous tradition of Indian astronomy going to very, very ancient times. I've just put some important writers over here. There are hundreds and hundreds more of writers over here. So clearly we have got accumulation of astronomy works in India going back to very ancient times. And once again, some important uh, Siddhantas along with the geography where they were. Aryabhata was in Patna, Brahmagupta was in Rajasthan, Bhaskara I was in Gujarat, Lalla in Malwa, again Vateshwara in Gujarat, this person Ujjain, Bhaskara II in Karnataka, Bijapur, 
நீலகண்ட சோமையாஜி இன் கேரளா அண்ட் குருக்ஷேத்ரா வாரணாசி ஒரிசா ஸோ வாட் இஸ் சீங் இஸ் இட் இஸ் நாட் ஆஸ் இஃப் நாலேஜ் வாஸ் ஓன்லி இன் நார்தர்ன் இந்தியா ஓன்லி இன் சதர்ன் இந்தியா ஆல் ஓவர் இந்தியா அவர் சயின்டிஸ்ட் வேர் ஜென்ரேட்டிங் நாலேஜ் ஷேரிங் திஸ் நாலேஜ் அண்ட் பில்டிங் த கார்பஸ் ஆஃப் நாலேஜ் தட் இஸ் வாட் வி லேர்ன் ஃப்ரம் ஃப்ரம் தீஸ் ஒர்க்ஸ் வி நோ த வெஸ்டர்னர்ஸ் வென் தே டிஸ்கவர்ட் இந்தியன் அஸ்ட்ரானமி several of them were absolutely fascinated with indian astronomy and the kind of timelines in it people like cassini lee gentil euler bailey playfair davis they were the first people to encounter indian works translated them and said indian astronomy is very very ancient however soon after william jones came along and he started the controversies he had observed commonality of sanskrit latin and greek and they wanted to address why are these languages related therein was born the idea of aryan invasion to india from central asia and aryans had to be in india in 1500 bce and the sanskrit literature was written after that so they asked how can indian astronomy have that antiquity if they wrote them from 1500 bce surely they can't have antiquity going back in time so they preferred their linguistic models on the basis of which they questioned the antiquity of indian astronomy so everybody are shown in red font over here william jones bentley whitney weber max muller thebot neuchbauer and pingree these are some of the westerners who contest indian astronomy the antiquity of that based on the ideas of aryan invasion for example whereas people like colbrook burgess and jacobi and others still were convinced that indian astronomy is very very ancient so these are some of the controversies how old is indian astronomy where did it originate the controversy is only for the west at this point they also question what did indians learn from the greeks they presume that indians learned from the greeks and they ask that question what did they learn from the greeks what did they learn from the babylonians and the reason is indian astronomy shows far greater antiquity than suggested by aryan invasion that comes from linguistic theories this is the reason but we can now show material evidence text stories siddhanta in indian astronomy and if we go looking for that we can see that in india astronomy was done to make sense of the sky the sky was a huge celestial calendar and marking of time to understand phases of the moon movement through the ecliptic movement of the sun movement of planets and to keep time through celestial calendar and we have got evidence in archaeology itself in kashmir the we see these rock paintings with sun and moon in karnataka we are seeing this in kashmir we are seeing the four cardinal points of astronomy maybe there's a supernova showing two suns in the sky and and such things and the famous mohenjadaro pashupati seal which abhyankar thinks it shows the equinoxes and solstices in 3000 bce and these standing figurines over here are showing a planetary alignment that happened in 3102 bce and moving forward they have got so many stone circles for example in andhra pradesh and places like that stone alignments and these are aligned along with the equinox direction it was a way for people to figure out when vernal equinox happens the sun must come back to a certain point and can we measure that using stones keeping two stones and such things so there are scientists who are trying to understand how these alignments are done with these stones to mark the passage of time itself and we have got a great many number of stories stories in india encode astronomy wisdom and we see that is in the metaphor of stories we have this heritage if you take a dslr camera and put it on a tripod after sunset you point it to the northern hemisphere keep the shutter open after about half an hour or so you see you got these star trails this star appears to be immobile in the sky it is not moving because the axis of rotation of the earth is pointing to this one this is polaris or dhruva and all the other stars are going in bigger and bigger circles around so indians had observed this and they maintain the story in the story of dhruva where dhruva uh, when he was young he had an unhappy childhood his father had married a younger woman and the younger woman did not allow dhruva to sit on his father's lap she pushes him away and he's so sad so he goes and does tapasya to vishnu to and when vishnu comes he wants to ask him where is my place in the universe and when vishnu comes he wants nothing but vishnu says after your time i'll make you into a motionless star in the sky you will be high above or everybody else even the saptarishis will go pradakshina around you that is what vishnu says 
and uh, this is an encoding of this phenomena that I've shown over here, the star trails, that Dhruva is immobile in the sky, everybody else goes in production around Dhruva. So this rotation phenomenon of the earth is maintained in the Dhruva story. Then we have got the concept of Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. This is very well known to Indians and they knew that from Uttarayana to Dakshinayana, the shadow of the sun goes north and north and north and northernmost point, then goes the southernmost point and they could estimate the length of the solar year based on that. And they uh, maintained that in the story of Vrika. Vrika is an Ashura who gets a boon from Rudra. Rudra is like the Agni or the sun that if he places his hand on a person's head, that person must die. Rudra gives him that boon and the minute he gets a boon, the Ashura wants to see if Rudra will die if he keeps his hand, hand on his head. Rudra runs and eventually there's a divine maiden who comes over there. Ashura is attracted by that maiden and he wants to marry her. She says, you're an uncouth uh, fellow, I'm not going to marry you. He says, no, 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 I can dance, I know the arts. So she says, follow my steps. And while she's dancing, she places her hand on her own head. Ashura forgets about that bone and he puts his hand on his head and he falls dead. He falls dead on the day of Uttrayana. So this simple story here, it is there in Bhagavad Purana, Srimad Bhagavatam. It is telling us about Uttrayana Dakshinayana. Vrika is another name for the wolf. It's a nocturnal animal. It hunts at night and sleeps during the day. When Vrika is chasing Rudra, that means the sun is running away. When the sun is running away, the nights are becoming longer and longer. Days are getting shorter and shorter. On the day of Uttarayana, Vrika is killed and the sun can come back, that can grow back in size. So these kind of stories have been maintained in our uh, past. And Indians had a very good idea about equinox, solstices and other such things. We also have in Matsya Purana and other Puranas the story of Chandra. Chandra married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. That is what we are told and promptly everybody starts laughing because Chandra is not a man, how can he marry and all these things. But we lose sight of what our ancestors wanted to tell us. Our ancestors were not idiots. They knew they wanted to communicate some wisdom. They observed that every day the moon appears over the eastern horizon at a slightly different time. Today if it appears at 8 o'clock at night, then the next day it might be 8.40 at night, you might have the sun rising. So they observed because of that, the backdrop of stars against which the moon is rising is different each day. They observed that it takes 27 days for the moon to come back to the same star, backdrop of stars. So they divided the entire ecliptic into 27 segments. In each of the segments, they observed the principal bright stars over there and gave that the name of the moon's wives, so they can remember them, mnemonics. The idea was moon would visit one wife every night. That was the thinking over here. So this story is related to the 27.3 day sidereal month. And then the story also says Daksha was furious. Daksha is the father-in-law, right? He was fu furious because he heard Chandra loves Rohini more than the other wives and he was not happy about it. How can you treat my daughters unequally? So he curses him. He says, because of what you've done, you'll die. Chandra, you will die. Chandra does not want to die. He runs out to Mahadeva and says, Mahadeva, I don't want to die. Mahadeva says, I can't change the curse, but I will uh, change it so that you, after you die, you will once again grow in strength till you get full strength and once again you lose it. So he says that you'll experience a life of waxing and waning. This part of the story is related to 29.5 day synodic month. So Indians are clearly aware that using the, sun, the moon, we can have two calendars. One is the sidereal calendar on the nakshatra, which is 27 days. Other one is on the tithi. Tithi is the phase of the, of the moon. This is 29.5 days, approximately 30 days. So they knew about both of them. And both ideas were used in Indian calendars to mark the passage of time. So this is what I've shown over here. From new moon to new moon is a synodic month of approximately 30 days. And the moon takes around 27 days to orbit the earth and this is a sidereal month. So the intellectual curiosity of our ancestors who wanted to reconcile the sidereal month, synodic month along with the solar year, that is what led to things like Adhikamasa, Things like yugas, five-year yuga, 19-year cycle, samvatsara cycle, chatur yuga cycle, all these were intellectual outputs of our ancestors 
to try to reconcile these various calendars to try to make them work together. And we are seeing, for example, even in Rig Veda, you can go as old as Rig Veda, we are seeing astronomy there. For example, here in Rig Veda 1.25.8, it says Varuna knows the 12 moons, meaning that each time there is a lunar month, it's either full moon or new moon. He's talking about the 12 moons over there. He also knows the moon of later birth. So it's a reference to the synodic months. Another place it says in Rig Veda, the wheel of time has 12 parts and 360 spokes or days or 720 pairs of days and nights. Very interesting. In another place it says, Vishnu or the sun sets in motion the wheel of three 120 day periods. This is referring to three seasons now. So what we are seeing is that even at the Rig Vedic stage itself, we have concepts of astronomy coming there, understanding of calendars and understanding of these things. Nakshatra and Rashi, these were the Indian astronomy model and this helps to mark the passage of time. So these are the nakshatras, like I said, Indians divided the sky in 13 and one third degree segments, there are 27 of them. If you multiply 27 and 13 and one third, you get 360 degrees. So the names of the moon's wives, Chitra, Vishaka, Jeshta, these are all those outer circle, as you can see. Indians are also aware that you can have a lunar month. So the concept of lunar month is, if the full moon appears in the Chitra nakshatra, that month is called the Chaitra Masa. In northern India, we use a full moon as an indicator. In southern India, we use the Amavasya or the new moon as an indicator. That is why we see a slight offset between the Chaitra Masa of the full moon and Chaitra Masa of the Amanta moon. In addition to marking the passage of time using lunar months, Indians are also interested in marking the passage of the sun. In order to mark the passage of the sun, we have the Rashi model where they divided the sky into 12 segments of 30 degrees each. And these are the familiar Rashis, Meena, Mesha, Vrishva, and other such things. These are the familiar Rashis that we have. So Indians could track the passage of the sun and the passage of the moon and uh, mark the passage of time using the nakshatras and Rashi model. This is the listing of our uh, nakshatras in two of our ancient books, Vedanga Jyotisha and Surya Siddhanta. We can see the names are more or less the same all through the list over here. And when the British came to India, they identified what these are, nakshatras are, in relation to the Western constellation names. So using the Pandit's help, Kritika was identified as Eta Tauri, Rohini as Alpha Tauri, Mrigashirsha as Lambda Orionis, and so on. So today we can use Western uh, constellation names and also and identify our nakshatras. This shows to us how ancient the nakshatra model is. It also shows to us that the, uh, the nakshatra model is common throughout India. So whether you look in Sanskritam, whether you look in Tamil, Malayalam, Gujarati, Telugu, Kannada, Hindi, Marathi, we are seeing that the nakshatra names are the same throughout India, except with small changes. For example, Ardra becomes Tiruvadirai in Malayalam and in Tamil, or Ashlesha becomes Ailiam. So small changes are there, but otherwise we are seeing that uh, the nakshatra model or the astronomy model is common throughout India, showing a pan-Indian technology. That is what we are seeing here. And some people try to say that Rashi was copied from Babylonian ideas into India during Varahamira's time. I have seen, for example, even in the Tanjavur, in Airavathavishara temple in Tarasharam, in the temple ceiling, we have got the Rashis on the, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, ceiling, which I have taken this picture over here, dated to around 1100 current era and so on. Subhash Kak also in an essay on Babylonian and Hindu astronomy, he notes that we had the 12 Adityas who were gradually replaced by the Rashi name in the first millennium BCE, hinting that the, even these knowledge systems were there in India itself over a very long period of time. So now we are in a position to talk about calendars, celestial coordinate systems and measurements, knowing that Indians had the synodic month using Tithi and phases of the moon. We had the sidereal month using nakshatras. We had the solar year using Uttrayana and Dakshinayana. First of all, Indians marked the passage of time using Panchanga. So in Panchanga, 
we use the notion of muhurta. Muhurta is one thirtieth of a day or a 48 minute interval. So typically at day rise, that is how Indians determine the beginning of the day, they would try to say what is the nakshatra, which is sidereal measurement, what is the tithi, that is synodic measurement, and what is the vara or the weekday, yoga, angle between sun and moon, and karana, tithi by two. So this was the way that Indians marked the passage of time during the day using the panchanga, for example. And we had the concept of weekdays. We got the Ravi, Soma, Mangala, Budan, Guru, Shukran, Shani. And a hint for why these names came about is there in Aryabhatiya as well as in Surya Siddhanta that talks about why the particular ordering is followed. And we also had the concept of solar month and the lunar month. Like as I've shown earlier, this is the uh, Rashi model, and these are based on whether the full moon or the new moon appears over a certain nakshatra. I've shown here that we got 5,000 plus years of time constants and calendars. For example, one muhurta is 48 minutes. 30 muhurtas is one ahoratram or a sidereal day of 24 hours. 30 ahoratrams is one masa. So we have 30 tithis, there's approximately 29.5 days or a synodic month. We have two masas, which is one ritu, which is a season of approximately uh, 60 days. Three ritus make one ayanam, either Uttrayana, Dakshinayana, approximately 180 days. Two ayanams make one varsha or a lunar year of 360 days. And the Rig Veda itself is talking about a year of 360 days. And you might wonder, Indians knew about a solar year of 365.24 days. How does that reconcile to 360 days? In the early days, Abhyankar says, the shortfall was adjusted by conducting an Atiratra sacrifice for 4.5 to 6 days, during which you don't measure the passage of time. But eventually, Atharva Veda is saying, the Rishi called Rohita, he created the Adhikamasa. Even Rig Veda 1.25.8 talks about that. So clearly, at some point in time, the Rishis had a mathematical procedure to figure out when an intercalary month should be inserted into the calendar. So we got synchrony between the solar calendar and the lunar calendar. This is the evidence that we see from, uh, from these works. And if we take a look at the calendars used in India, pan-India regional calendars, we see in some parts of uh, India, the northern part, the blue color over here, uses the Purni Amantha month. Western, we have the Western Amantha. Southern, we use the Southern Amantha. We also have a solar calendar in Kerala, in Tamil Nadu, in places in Andhra, Odisha, Bengal, and so on. So this is some remembrance from the Purana genealogies that we have the Chandra Vamshi and the Surya Vamshi. These could have been families that followed either the solar calendar or the lunar calendar. So some remembrances there, even today in India, based on the kind of calendrical systems that we uh, follow. Indians also observed the 60-year Samvatsara cycle. They knew that Saturn takes approximately 30 years to complete one revolution and Jupiter takes about 12 years to complete one revolution. So 30 times 2 or 12 times 5 is 60. That is a resonance of Saturn and Jupiter when they both return to the same zodiacal plane. So Indians observed that periodic periodicity also in a calendar called Samvatsara cycle. And this is followed throughout India. We follow this kind of Samvatsara cycle. We also had various eras. Eras now measure from some point how many years have elapsed. So what I've shown to you is in the Panchanga, we had the Mahurta. We had the Nakshatra of the day. We had the Tithi of the day. We, were, we have weekdays. We have got lunar months, solar months. We had Uttrayana, Dakshinayana year. In addition to all these things, you might want to know how many years have elapsed. So we used eras like the Kali Yuga era, Buddha Nirvana, we had Shaka era, Gupta era, and Shalivahana era. So different eras have been there in India to mark how many years have elapsed since a major event has occurred. Even that has been there. And Indians in investigating the nature of time have done so many amazing things. The Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, is talking about Vedic cosmology, the Hindu cycle of time, in which we have the concept of a Chatur Yuga. A Chatur Yuga has got four Yugas. 
Satya, Treta, Dwapara and Kali Yuga in 4 is to 3 is to 2 is to 1 ratio. So the 1 is 432,000 years, which is Kali Yuga's for, uh, duration. Multiply that by 2, you get 864,000 years, which is Dwapara Yuga. Multiply that by 2, you get Treta Yuga. Multiply by 2, you get Dwa Satya Yuga. So the total is 4.32 million years, that is the duration of a Chatur Yuga. And Indians took 1,000 of them to form a Maha Yuga, 71 of them for a Manvantara, 14 of them to form a Kalpa or a creation event, which takes 4.32 billion years. This was seen as one day of Brahma, is one Kalpa. It's just like one Brahma's got one day, he's also got one night of a similar duration, during which pralaya or dissolution of the universe happens. There's also a period of Sandhya, then nothing happens. We are not accounted for that over here. In the Indian thinking, in Srimad Bhagavatam, we are in the 51st year of the current Brahma. Each Brahma lives for 100 such Brahma years. So there's a staggering amount of time that our ancestors have been able to think in cosmology since creation has happened and how it's a recurrent creation that life will continue on, destroy, continue on. This idea is encoded in Srimad Bhagavatam and other works that talk about the cycle of time in India. And we have had a long tradition of astronomical observations. Many, many phenomena have been observed by our scientists, our rishis. For example, they have observed solar and lunar eclipses. We have, for example, Rishi Atri in Rig Veda. It says that he observed a solar eclipse, but maybe that is not the end of the story. What is so special in observing a solar eclipse? Anybody could observe a solar eclipse. He has done something more than that. Tilak is talking about it. I'll presently say how maybe Rishi Atri not only saw the eclipse, he also predicted that the eclipse would occur, meaning that he had a mathematical means, understanding of the phenomena and trying to do these things. So the, uh, this particular eclipse is uh, supposed to be either 4677 BCE or 4202 BCE. Aryabhata is the one who tried to explain the phenomena where you see if we have the plane of the sun called the ecliptic, then the orbit of the, uh, of the moon is tilted at 5 degrees from the ecliptic, which means eclipses can only happen when these nodes converge. So you can have a solar eclipse here or a lunar eclipse window over here. So Aryabhata called this ascending node as Rahu and the descending node as Ketu. Till then, many people laughed at how superstitious Indians were in thinking that some demon called Rahu is swallowing the sun. But that was a metaphor. And Aryabhata clearly is showing what it means in terms of the geometry of the moon's orbit with respect to the ecliptic. And Aryabhata in his work, Aryabhatiya, he estimated the length of Earth's shadow, Moon's shadow, duration of the eclipse. He had formulas, he had formulas using which he could compute all these quantities. So we are seeing that from Atri to Aryabhata, we are seeing huge amount of knowledge over here. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about Rishi Atri and the quadrant. In this work, Journal of Science in 1924, Astronomy, page 57, there's a description of the solar eclipse of Rishi Atri. So here, they're referencing Tilak's translation, where he's saying that maybe Atri used a Turiya Yantra. A Turiya Yantra is a quadrant in locating the sun totally eclipsed. It's there in Rig Veda in the fifth mandala, 40.6, it talks about this. And uh, uh, Tilak is interpreting the Turiya to be this device that is shown over here, that is a quadrant. And quadrants were used even in China, for example. Huge quadrants to measure the angle between the sun and moon, for example. It is used in the Arabic culture also. It is also used in uh, medieval Europe. So it looks like the Rig Veda is talking about a three having used a Turiya device in order to estimate the uh, angle between the sun and the moon. This is what we have seen here in Orion, uh, Tilak's work. So Atri knew the eclipse sun by Thuriya Brahma. So he's interpreting that by means of Thuriya. So what does it mean? So Atri had some instrumentation based on which is computing the angle between the sun and the moon, based on which he can say, are we going to see an eclipse? 
how many days later are we going to see the eclipse. So he has understood the model, what is the phenomena of eclipse, how does it happen. He has understood it is the angle between sun and moon eventually converging to zero at the eclipse point and he has got a means of measuring it also. If Tilak's interpretation is taken, this means Atri understood the phenomena of eclipse, he had an instrument to measure the angles, he had a predictive capability. Using prediction he could do that. Amazing that uh, this was done in India in 4202 BCE or 6000 years before now, our ancestors were already observing eclipses and estimating how that would happen and Aryabhata has explained to us uh, the exact mathematics and so on. What else did Indians observe? They also observed precision. Precision is something that the earth is doing. The axis of rotation of the earth is tracing a circle in the sky that takes around 26,000 years to complete and Indians could estimate that also. We'll talk about this a little later. For example, Suri Siddhanta, it talks about this. Indians also observe transits. Transits are the inner planets like Mercury and Venus. From our perspective, they go across the face of the sun. And this is a picture that I took in 2016 when Mercury was going across the face of the sun. This little dot here is Mercury. So Indians observed they could estimate when transits would happen and they used them to refine the models that they were using. In the Western experience, only after Galileo had the telescope, Kepler got a lot of data, only then Europeans were in a position to predict the transit of Venus. It's the first in the Western world, whereas this was routine work in ancient India. Indians were doing these kinds of things. Here are two of our ancient scientists, Mallikarjuna Suri from Andhra Pradesh, who had estimated this transit phenomena and discussed about how Venus and Mercury appear when they're going through the sun's surface. Kamalakara, who was from Maharashtra, he's even saying Mercury and Venus will look like holes on the sun. Remember, he did not have any telescopes or things like that. Today, if we look at the sun, we know how difficult it is to see the sun. But he knows that these planets will look like holes in the sun. If you take a look at the picture that I've taken of, uh, uh, of this one, you see that this is how Mercury appears, like a dot, a black dot over here, a hole in the sun. So clearly, Kamalakara knew what he's talking about. And uh, uh, so we, we know Indians were doing this kind of thing for a long time. They also observed planetary conjunctions. When planets come close to each other, or the moon and a planet or a moon and the star come close to each other, these are conjunctions. It is called Yudh in uh, Suri Siddhanta, and we find uh, these things. Indians also observed occultation when the moon covers a star or some such thing, nakshatra, that was called an occultation. I've explained why Chandra loved Rohini more than his other wives, that is related to the occultation phenomena. I've discussed that in a TEDx talk. Indians also observed comets. These are called Dhumaketu in the Indian context. And we know the Rig Veda, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Parashara, Vridhigarga, Varamira, Sangamira, Tamil works, they are all talking about various comets at various times. But we don't know what these early comets were because the periodicity of the comets is so great. So comets from 12th century onwards can be estimated correctly, but earlier comets, we have no idea what are these comets that uh, people have recorded in, in, in the literature over here. So we have discussed a lot of things in astronomy so far. I'd love, now like to tell you about the precision phenomena, how the Indian calendar requires revisions over time because of the precision phenomena. I'd like to explain to you about that. So if you take a look at this graphic over here, Milankovitch cycle, we are seeing that the Earth, in addition to rotation, in addition to revolution around the sun, once in 365.24 days, it is going through orbital cycle where the orbit is going from elliptical to circular in 100,000 years, or the axial precision, the axis of rotation of the Earth, is tracing a circle in the sky that takes 26,000 years, or a change in obliquity from 21 degrees to about 23, 24 degrees in 41,000 years. So these are responsible for amount of radiant energy we get from the sun, therefore the ice ages, drought periods we have, but we are interested in Indian astronomy on the second cycle, axial precision, because Indians always observed when vernal equinox comes, 
what is the nakshatra at the vernal equinox point? For example, they might say Kritika was at the vernal equinox point. Today we know that it's no longer Kritika at vernal equinox point because of precision. Because of precision, things have moved on. So we can date back in time and say Kritika was there in 2400 BC, for example. Indians knew all of these things. They knew the cardinal points of astronomy, winter solstice, summer solstice, vernal equinox, autumn equinox. They knew the reference planes, horizon, ecliptic, equator. They knew reference points, celestial pole, north, south, east, west. And so with all these things, we can now have a coordinate system where they can locate stars in the sky. So today we have many coordinate systems. For example, we can have equatorial coordinate system that rotates with the Earth's rotation. Or we can have altitude azimuth coordinate system. Such things are used for telescopes and so on. But ancient Indians used the ecliptic coordinate system where the uh, vernal equinox, that point marked the zero longitude for Indians. So the zero longitude for ancient Indians is the vernal equinox position. And we know the vernal equinox changes with precision. As precision slowly changes, where is the vernal equinox point for the zero longitude? That too changes with time. For example, Mrigashirsha, that was at vernal equinox in 4000 BC, 6000 years ago. Rohini was there in 3000 BC. Kritika was there in 2300 BC. We know this because of precision. We know that Indian calendar must keep changing because of precision. So Suri Siddhanta is saying the circles of the nakshatras, asterisms, rotates 600 times in a Chaturyuga. So what it says is it moves from 0 to 27 degrees, back to 0, minus 27, back to 0. And this is the kind of rotation that is there, explained the Suri Siddhanta. I've taken this data from Professor M. L. Raja, Avinash Research in Coimbatore, where he's showing a yuga has got 4.32 million years. In 4.32 million years, if we complete 600 revolutions, that means it takes 7,200 years per revolution. Indians called this precision phenomena as ayana chalana. So if we take 600, multiplied by 27, multiplied by these four segments going to 0 to 27 to back to 0, minus 27, back to 0, four segments are there, multiplied by 60 to convert it to minutes, multiplied by 60 to convert it to seconds, divided by a Chaturyuga, 4.32 million years, the answer is 54 arc seconds a year. Amazing accuracy in Surya Siddhanta that is talking to you how much does the precision change every year. If I keep my fist in the sky, it is extending 15 degrees in the sky. If I extend just my pinky in the sky at arm's length, that is one degree in the sky. Now I want you to imagine, we are not talking about one degree, we are not talking about one minute, we are talking about 54 arc seconds. There is such a small number, that is how much it changes, equinox position changes year upon year. Our Indians are able to measure that, estimate that, and Suri Siddhanta has got a figure for you of 54 arc seconds a year. You might also wonder, what about other civilizations? Did they also know about precision? Well, we can take a look in this table. Suri Siddhanta, I'm not going to put a date on it. The estimate is 54 arc seconds a year. Parashara Siddhanta has got about 1400 BC, according to Professor R. Nainger. It is quoting the same figure. I think it is copied it from Suri Siddhanta. Vridhi Garga, Professor Abhayankar, is showing Vridhi Garga approximately 800 BCE. He had an estimate for precision at 36 arc seconds a year. By the time we come to Hipparchus in Greek tradition, 120 BCE, he has copied the Indian figure directly and he too says 36 arc seconds a year. In China, you see in 307 current era, he had a figure of 72 arc seconds a year, greatly in error. Aryabhata had got it to 48 arc seconds a year, which is closer than uh, Suri Siddhanta. The actual figure is 50.4 arc seconds a year. Suri Siddhanta is off by 4 arc seconds, but Aryabhata is off by just 2 arc seconds. The Arabs, they copied wholesale all the Indian works. They took Suri Siddhanta, translated that, and that's how they got their knowledge. So they are also echoing Suri Siddhanta's value of 54 arc seconds a year. Munjala estimated approximately 60 arc seconds a year. 
Bhaskara the second had a very accurate figure at 48.6 arc seconds a year. By the time we come to Patani, Samantha, Chandrasekhar, 1900, using naked eye observations, he had a figure of 49.179 arc seconds a year. This is what should be amazing to us, that our Indians invested a lot of mental energy to understanding precision and they were able to estimate it to these various figures through the times. And we also know we have about 5,000 years of instruments used to measure the skies. We know in Harappa, for example, we had the water clocks. This is also mentioned in Vedanga Jyotisha, Aryabhata. So he's talking about all of these uh, instruments that we see here. By the time we come to Varahamira, he has also got graphical calculations. The way students do XY graph today, he had graphical calculations also. Brahmagupta has got uh, a whole lot of quadrants like the Thuriya Golaka and other such things. Bhaskara the one, Bhaskara the first is talking about circular platform with graduated circumference. I believe this is very similar to what I saw in Lothar. In Lothal, I saw this uh, brick circular platform which nobody there knew what it was. But by reading Bhaskara's description, I believe there's the same thing there in Lothal itself, showing how ancient this is. Lala had the armillary sphere. By the time we come to Mahindra Suri, we're talking about Islamic times. He had the uh, astrolabe. Maharaja Jai Singh used European instruments itself. So we have got evidence in India with more than 5,000 years of measuring the skies. This is the evidence that we have. Remember that if our scientists are measuring the skies, measurement implies some kind of mathematics. It implies we are going to use it some kind of model. It implies some kind of predictive capability or some kind of mathematics, Siddhanta, that's going to be used. So we have to show that measurements lead to modeling and prediction. We have to show evidence of mathematical modeling for astronomy. And we see that in the so-called rule of three. It is there in the Lagadas uh, Vedanga Jyotisha, which is dated to 1400 BCE. So over here, Rig Vedanga Jyotisha, Yajur Vedanga Jyotisha, it says the rule of three to obtain the desired result should be applied again and again to the day. So for simplification, I've shown this equation, A by B equal to C by X, where X is the unknown quantity, with cross multiplication, we get x is equal to bc by a. This is what Vedanga Jyotisha is saying. In other words, if Mars is over there, in two days time, Mars moves by delta s. So delta t is two days, and delta s is a distance, it has moved so much. I want to know in eight days time, where will Mars be? So that is the problem that Vedanga Jyotisha has taken up, and I've shown this over here. Let a planet move delta s units in delta t time, then in time t, how many units does it move? And the answer is what Vedanga Jyotisha is saying. And he's saying, apply this answer again and again, the known result, apply it again and again, so you can keep predicting, even for one year if you like. It may be in error, but you can do the prediction. This our ancestors were doing in 1400 BCE. That is the evidence from Vedanga Jyotisha. And we have evidence that, remember, the sky is curved. So if we do linear straight lines, we are going to have errors in that. So our ancestors have already observed there are errors. We have to get better accuracy. So trigonometry was invented. The Westerners say Hipparchus is the father of trigonometry, but that is absurd because they only had this. This is a chord table. This is not trigonometry. Trigonometry is right angle triangles. This is described in Surya Siddhanta. This is described in Aryabhatiya. So Indians had trigonometry, the Greeks did not have trigonometry, they had chord tables. And the Indians were able to do very refined estimates of the skies using these uh, trigonometry and so on. And we have evidence of the desire for more and more accuracy in the modeling. If you take a look at the historical record, Aryabhata used linear interpolation, Bhaskara the first had uh, analytical formulas for sine x, Brahmagupta in Brahmasputta Siddhanta, he's talking about second order interpolation. And by the time we come to Kerala, Madhava, he has got infinite series expansion for sin x, cos x, tan inverse x, implying that there's evidence of observation, modeling, refinement. Indians are not happy. Once you have a model, I cannot predict well enough. They try to understand why is the error there, and they had some novel inventions using which they were able to get better and better accuracy. 
the evidence is there in the record that we see over here. Indians also had a planetary model. They understood the planet movements and they wanted to have a model of the planet movements, how is it moving around and so on and so forth. And Westerners thought that Indians did not have a planetary model. For example, David Pingree, who was a professor in New York, he said Aryabhata did not observe and he wanted to know how is it that he arrived at mean motions that are so correct. And the answer is simple according to him. He used Greek tables of mean motion to compute the longitude. So in other words, he presumed Aryabhata did not observe one. Second, he presumed that Aryabhata copied from the Greeks. I have already shown to you that Aryabhata had a number of instruments using which he was measuring. Clearly, he was observing the sky. Clearly, he was making measurements and so on. And uh, we also know that Aryabhata had referred to the works of earlier Indian scientists like Parashara and others. And uh, so we had a lot of data from that. So Parashara's work in 1400 BCE. So what we are seeing, this is a work by Professor Iyengar. First, he dates this scientist to the same time as Vedanga Jyotisha, which is 1400 BCE. And we see in Parashara's work, Path of Mercury, he's talking about that. He's talking that Jupiter traveling two and quarter nakshatras in one year leads to good crops. This is a mathematical data. We know that each nakshatra is 13 and one third degrees. So he's saying Jupiter travels two and quarter nakshatras in a year. This is a mathematical piece of data, which has been used by Aryabhata. Then he says Saturn travels through the 27 nakshatras for 28 years. This is also mathematical data that results in approximately 30 years, that is Saturn's orbital period, that is contained over here. Similarly for Venus, even for Venus, according to him, it is the cycle is 591 days, but today we know it's around 584 days. So there's some data over here, even for Venus path and things of this nature. By the time we come to Suri Siddhanta, Suri Siddhanta has got a lot of mathematical data in a Mahayuga. It says how many revolutions of the sun, 4,320,000, of the moon, of Mercury, of Venus. So there are a lot of mathematical data given here in Suri Siddhanta, which we can put into a tabular form to understand. For example, sun, how many revolutions in a Mahayuga, 4.32 million years. And we can compute the mean daily movement of that object. For example, sun is 59 minutes, 8 seconds and so on. Mercury is 4 degrees, 5 minutes, 32 seconds. Venus is 1 minute, 1 degree, 36 uh, minutes and so on. So our ancient Indians clearly had enough of data to tell you the planetary model, how much is it going to move day by day, how much is the movement and so on. And to get this, we have done the daily mean motion is number of revolutions in Mahayuga divided by number of days in Mahayuga multiply by 360, you will get these data that I have talked about from Surya Siddhanta. Indians also had a planetary model based on epicycles. Aryabhata is talking about that, where Earth is at the center, Moon goes around the Earth, Mercury goes around the Earth, but it has got a cycle of its own called an epicycle. Venus goes around the Earth, it's also got a cycle of its own called epicycle. So on Mars, Jupiter, Saturn and so on. And this is a pulsating epicycle, contracting and expanding. And by observing this, we can see evidence of spherical geometry, trigonometry, measurement devices, prediction, tracking, mathematical equation modeling, error correction, approximation, parameter fitting. All this is evident because there's no way Aryabhata can use such a complicated model without all of this mathematical artifices to try and tell you how things move. So this is what we can recover from today's understanding of math. By the time we come to Nilakanta Somayaji in 1400 in Kerala School of Math, we are seeing that they did not stop saying Acharya Aryabhata has already got a model, I am not going to change it. They did not do that. They observed there are problems in the model and they tried to refine that and make it better and better. So their model was Earth is at the center, Moon goes around the Earth, Sun goes around the Earth, but Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn are going around the Sun. And Sun with all these planets is going around the Earth. This is a partial heliocentric model. So we are seeing that this model was used by Tycho Brahe in Europe 
150 years after Nilakanta Somayaji had proposed this in India. So we are seeing a dynamic tradition of knowledge is taking place in India. Then this work is trying to show us how accurate the Indian epicycle model is compared to the Greek model. This is by Dr. Anil Narayanan. And he's showing, for example, if you take a look at the error profile for solar long longitude, he's showing that in the year 2000 and the year 100, the strong line is the error in the Indian epicycle model and the dotted line, dashed line, is the error in the Greek uh, epicycle model. We can see that the error in the Greek model is much greater than the error in Indian model, showing Indian epicycle was far more accurate. Then also the colonial historian Brennand in 1896, he studied these things in Surya Siddhanta and he said the epoch of Surya Siddhanta appears to be made around 3500 BCE, according to Brennand. And Anil Narayanan did a simulation study to see when will the error be smallest using the Indian model. So he showed the Indian model error is so great in 2000 our time, 100 current era, 1000 BC error is going down, 3000 BC error is going down. When he went to 5000 BC, you can see the error is the smallest, the small line over here, that is error. So he tried to show that the error in the Indian model is least in this time frame. So what we learned by looking at this is that Indians had a sophisticated epicycle model with a pulsating epicycle far superior to the Greek model in terms of accuracy and prediction. And this also calls out the bluff of Professor Pingree and the others who said Indians did not have a planetary theory and so on. Clearly, Indians had a planetary theory. Clearly, Indians had trigonometry, whereas the Greeks only had chord tables and things like that. And we have had greatly accurate uh, ways of estimating the motions of uh, planets and other, other heavenly bodies. We have had a long tradition of mathematical astronomy works. I'm going to show you some selected works in astronomers. First thing first, we know that there is 5,000 years of innovation We've got, for example, Lagada in 1400 BC, Baudhayana, Katyayana, Pingala, we'll see their works a little later. And we have seen that mathematics development was arrested in the north after Islamic invasion. It moved to the south under the protection of the Vijayanagara Empire. It died in the south too after colonialism came. So we're seeing people like Aryabhatta, Varahamira, Brahmagupta, all of them thrived in northern India before the Islamic invasions. Bhaskara II in Ujjain is the last that we have, the greats, around 1185 current era. After that, the Islamic invasions put an end to scholarship in northern India. But then it moved to the south under the protection of Vijayanagar, Madhava, Sangamagrama, Parameshwara, Nilakanta Somayaji. So they continued the tradition of Indian knowledge systems. But that too died out after 17th century Kamalakara and others, thanks to colonialism. So we are seeing the tradition of Indian knowledge from very ancient times, interrupted by Muslims, later interrupted by colonials, and has completely died out today. So Aryabhata is one of the greats that we are talking about, Kusumapura. He wrote this famous work called Aryabhatiya. It contains a whole lot of chapters on mathematics and astronomy and so on. He talked about rotation of the earth, eclipses, epicycle model for solar system. He also had a powerful Kutuka algorithm to solve the equations of the kind ax minus by equal to c. He had these uh, uh, summation, 1 square, 2 square, up to n square, 1 square, 2 square, up to n cube. So many intellectual accomplishments can be attributed to Aryabhata, one of the best scientists perhaps we had for a long time. Varamira, so his importance is he wrote commentaries on these works, this Paita Maha Siddhanta, Vashishta Siddhanta, Romaka, Polisa Siddhanta, Surya uh, uh, Siddhanta. And it is important because some of these works don't exist anymore. But we know what it contained because of Varamira's commentaries on them. Brahmagupta, who studied the works of his predecessors, Aryabhata I, Latadeva, Varamira and the others, he wrote Brahmasputta Siddhanta and other works. These were taken by the Arabs when they conquered Sindh and they took this work to, Arab, uh, to Baghdad where they were able to translate it into Arabic. That's how they learned mathematics. That's how they learned astronomy through Indian works. Solution of linear, quadratic, indeterminate equations, rules for zero operation, interpolation formulas, a lot of astronomy. 
Then Bhaskara the first in 600 current era, who wrote a Bhashya on Aryabhatiya, who had this functional formula for sin x. And Bhaskara the second, who used to live in Bijapur, but he went to Ujjain and became a professor in the, in the university there. And uh, his biggest work was Siddhanta Shiromani where he's talking about elements of differential calculus and many other interesting works. Madhava of Sangarma Grama from Trishur, all these infinite series I've shown here were proposed by him and he's the founder of Kerala School of Astronomy where they worked on infinite series, calculus, trigonometry, algebra, iterative solution of equations. And C.K. Raju says Madhava's mathematics was transmitted to Europe one century before Newton and others knew about it through the Syrian Christian church and so on. Very interesting to see that. So in Madhava school, we are from Madhava, Parameshwara, Damodara, Nelakanta Somayaji, Deva, and others. So these were the people who belonged to the school. So with that, I'd like to close out the astronomy by also talking to you about the antiquities seen in Indian astronomy. So this is paradoxical because linguistic analysis says that Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE and composed the uh, Sanskrit works in India. If that is true, then how can we have Indian astronomy showing great antiquity? That is what I'm going to highlight over here. The first is, what is the antiquity of the book Vedanga Jyotisha? Many people try to date this, Weber to find it BC, William Jones 1100 BC, Lokomanya Tilak, Kohlbrook, Dikshit. Dikshit came closest at 1400 BCE. And to simulate this, we have to first understand what is the astronomical phenomena that, is, that we can use in Vedanga Jyotisha. And Abhyankar shows that it is Vedanga Jyotisha, it states winter solstice occurred when the sun and moon came together in the Dhanishta nakshatra. So we have to see when was winter solstice in the Dhanishta nakshatra. It no longer is true today because of the precision phenomena. So we had to go back in time to see that. The previous slide, we saw how Professor Abhayankar said, Vedanga Jyotisha contains a line that says, sun and moon came together in winter solstice in the Dhanishta nakshatra. So we want to simulate when was that possible. So what you're seeing here is a planetarium software with a projection of Earth's latitudes and longitudes on the sky, which become celestial coordinates. And the center point over here, the celestial north pole. And these circles that you see are the celestial latitudes, if you will. I'm using a, a simple terms here. And these are the celestial longitudes, if you will. It's called right ascension and declination. These are the words used in uh, astronomy for these things. But anyway, so, this line here is a ground line. This is the north side, east side, west side, and south is towards you. So you're looking at the northern skies, if you will. If we count from here, 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. On Earth, 0 is the equator. In the sky, it becomes celestial equator. Then from, uh, from 0, we have minus 10, minus 20, minus 24. So when the sun is at minus 24, we know it has gone to the southernmost point, the solstice point, which is winter solstice. At that winter solstice, we want to see what is the nakshatra on that longitude. We see Dhanishta over here. So in order to get Dhanishta at the winter solstice position, I've had to crank the astronomy software back to 1440 BCE. That is how we say Vedanga Jyotisha and Lagada should be dated approximately around 1400 to 1440 BCE. That's a timeline of that uh, person. So Rishi Yajnavalkya in Shatapata Brahmana, he says Kritika never swerves from the east direction. Therefore, the Vedic practitioner can light his uh, Yajna fires under the Kritika nakshatra. That is what he writes in Shatapata Brahmana. How do we interpret this message? Balakanga the Tilak tried to point it out saying that this is referring to heliacal rising of Kritika at the equinox point. So what we are seeing here is if you, if you crank it back to 2982 BCE, again from 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 0. 0 is a celestial equator. This is the ground line. So when the sky is still dark, the Vedic practitioner has his ritual bath, comes outside, looks to the east direction, he sees the Kritika nakshatra there. 
Then one hour later, the sun rises and it washes out Kritika, but no problem. He's got a straight line. He knows the two points. He puts the Vedic bricks under the Kritika and lights it in the east direction. So this is what was meant when Kritika never swerves from east direction. This can be dated to a staggering 2982 BCE in Shatapatha Brahmana. This is the timeline that we associate now based on astronomy for Rishi Yajnavalkya. Then we have an ancient epoch that is encoded in our tables. For example, many of our Puranas talk about Kali Yuga. Then we have Aryabhata, Suri Siddhanta referring to this epoch. Pulisa Siddhanta, Brahmagupta, Albaruni all refer to this epoch. I hold a temple epigraphy in Karnataka that also refers to this epoch. The mathematician astronomer called Cassini, he got some tables from Thailand from another French explorer and uh, he sent it to Cassini to study and he said that these Siam tables seem to be having the longitude of Benares and also they has an absolute date encoded there in February 18th midnight 3102 BCE. That was Cassini's observation. Then Playfair, later on Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, Burgess, all of them determined the same epoch referred to in Surya Siddhanta, also to the same timeline. It turns out to be a conjunction of planet, sun and moon in the Revati nakshatra. Is this the same that we typically identify as Revati nakshatra today, for example? And uh, this is the data that is there in Suri Siddhanta that uh, they try to make use of. I have simulated this in, this in this planetarium software, going to February 18th, 3102 BCE. What we are seeing is the sun is now in the Revati nakshatra that is over here. And we are seeing that Guru, that is Jupiter, Shukra and Venus are almost on top of each other clustered here. Chandra is over here. And we are seeing Mangala, Mars is here. Buddha and Mercury is here. Shani is a little far away, but still almost in the same area, Saturn. So this kind of a clustering in the Revati nakshatra has not happened in the last 26,000 years or so, except in this 3102 BCE. So the question now comes, how did ancient Indians encode this particular phenomena? Did they back calculate that? If they back calculated that, it calls for enormous accuracy of our planetary models. That kind of accuracy did not exist. This means Indians have a remembrance of this phenomena and that cultural memory has been passed on generation to generation and has been encoded for us. And now we can crank it back in time and look at this particular phenomena. Going forward, we have in Rig Veda the story of Aditi. We know that Aditi along with the co-sister Diti, they married the Rishi Kashyapa and through them we have the Devas and the Daityas. For us, the interesting thing is in the Aitreya Brahmana of the Rig Veda, translation by Martin Hogg. In this, in the second chapter, we are seeing a very cryptic passage over here. It says the sacrifice or the yajna went away from the Devatas. The Devatas were unable to perform any further ceremony. Remember that in the old India, we looked at the skies to figure out when to perform a certain ceremony. So they were not able to perform it. They did not know where it had gone to. They said to Aditi, let us know the sacrifice through thee. Aditi says, Tathastu, but I will choose a bone from you. They said, choose. She chose this bone. All sacrifices will commence with me and end with me. So this is a very cryptic passage in Aitreya Brahmana where we are trying to figure out what exactly is going on over here. Again, Balagangadhar Tilak came to the rescue and he said that this is referencing a time when Indians were confused in their calendar. Their calendar was no longer relevant because of the effect of precision. Precision over thousands of years results in your uh, nakshatras not being where they're supposed to be and so on. So Indians are confused and they have reset the calendar to Aditi. And Aditi is saying, vernal equinox will begin with me and end with me. That is what she's saying. Vernal equinox begin with me and end with me. So uh, Tilak pointed this out and he said we should now look for when did vernal equinox occur at uh, what is uh, what we know as Aditi. Aditi for us comes in the Punar Vashu nakshatra. Punar Vashu nakshatra has got two stars. One is Aditi, other is Diti. In the Greek tradition, these are called Castor and Pollux, the twin stars. 
So to crank this back in time, I have to go to 6000 BCE. In 6000 BCE, we are seeing that the sun is at the vernal equinox position and the longitude there is Punarvashu. So the Rig Vedic story that talks about Aditi can be dated to almost 8000 years. The important thing for us is, it is telling us there was some calendrical system that Indians were using at that period of time. And over thousands of years, that calendar is useless because of the effect of precision. They have been confused and they have... That is what has come out in this particular aspect. And uh, we can look at the staggering period of time we are talking about over here. One more story for the antiquity of Indian astronomy. This is now the Ashwins. So the, they appear in Rig Veda, Markandeya Purana, Matsya Purana and so on. So we are told in the Rig Veda that Surya, his spouse was Sanjana and through them we have the Yama, Yami and so on. But one fine day Surya becomes so hot that his wife could not take the heat. So Sanjana abandons her husband. She goes off to the cooler region according to what we learn. But then she leaves a shadow Chaya in her place. One fine day, Surya discovers the deception and asks Chaya, where is my wife? And she says she's gone to the cooler region. So sun also goes to cooler region. That is what it says in the Rig Vedic story. We understand that when the sun has gone to the cooler region, it means it's gone to the southernmost point, which means it's winter solstice in the northern hemisphere. And he finds that she's taken the form of a mare and he too takes the form of a horse and the Ashwini Kumaras are born as a result of that union. This is what we are told. At the same time, we also have verses in the Rig Veda that says Ushas. Ushas is a goddess of dawn. So Ushas awakened the Ashwinis for their share of the Vedic sacrifice. So this is very clear. It means that Ashwinis are appearing at dawn, heliacal rising with Surya, when Surya is in the winter solstice position. This is what Balakangar, the Tilak says, look for the point when Ashwins appear with sun at dawn, heliacal rising in the winter solstice point. That is what we look for. And when I simulated this, this goes to a staggering 7200 BCE. When you go to that period of time, now we can see from 90 degrees here, this is 0 degrees, the celestial equator, minus 10, minus 20, minus 24. When the sun is the celestial equator, when Ashwinis are in the longitude, it has got to be this time frame, 7200 BC. So this is the antiquity of the Rig Vedic story that is talking about Surya. This is what we decide from this. And amazingly, I've got a correlation of the story, corroboration of the story rather, with a scientific paper that came out one year back in 2022 in Nature that is talking about a solar flare that is bigger than anything we have known that happened precisely in 7176 BCE. How do they know it with such precision? Because when the solar flare happened at that great magnitude, they, there, was, there was proton activity in the northern and southern poles because magnetic lines of force conduct the charged particles there. And there's been isotopic content created in the upper atmosphere, resulting in the northern lights, southern lights. And that is preserved in the ice core record in Antarctica, Greenland, Scientists have drilled the ice cores, they studied these things, and they've said that suddenly in 7176 BCE, the isotope contents are so great, unimaginably great in that time frame. So that's when I read the paper, I said, oh my goodness, this is exactly the same thing we are talking about in the story. The time frame matches perfectly. Even in India, we have the remembrance, Surya suddenly became brilliant, so brilliant that Sanjana could not take the heat. She goes away and her father Vishwakarma comes and chops off the sun's brilliance and then after some time Surya is able to bearable, that is bearable. That is what we are told in the Indian story. Using science we can explain this perfectly. I recommend that you take a look at the story called Once Upon a Time 9000 Years Ago on rajvedam.medium.com. I have discussed this in great detail there. Or you take a look at the YouTube video called Fascinating Facts of Indian Astronomy by, on Sangam Talks. On that also, I've discussed this in great detail along with discussion of the papers that show the corroboration, independent collab corroboration by science as well as our uh, archaeoastronomical observation over here.
fascinating for me because the validation of what we are saying. So this date now, like we say, is 7200 BC or 9200 years before present. So with this, we can now rebut untenable Western assertions. The Westerners have spent much effort to discredit Indian astronomy because they knew Indian astronomy contains great antiquity. How can they explain that if they want to promote the linguistic analysis? Linguistic analysis in order to explain why Sanskrit, Latin and Greek are related, they've come about with the notion that there's an Aryan invasion and there was a proto-Indo-European ancestral language from which Sanskrit is derived. If those facts are true, then Aryan invasion must happen in 1500 BCE. That is why Max Muller said, Chandas period, Mantra period, Sutra period, all this is when Vedic literature was composed in, in India from 1200 BCE to 200 current era. He stuffed everything over there. If that is true, how can the Vedic texts contain astronomy showing this great antiquity? There's a problem over there. So the Western approach to this was, they discredited all of Indian astronomy. They said all Indian works are unreliable, we can't use it, therefore the uh, linguistic theory is correct. So this is one way to deal with it when you have inconvenient facts. Instead of analyzing the data, you say it's unreliable and throw it out. So that's what I am shown over here. In Max Miller's chronology, Chandas period is the earliest books of Rig Veda, Mantra period remaining books, Brahmana period 600 BC when all the Brahmanas, Upanishads, Aranyakas were made. Sutra period is when things like astronomy, Vedanga, Jyotisha and others were composed. But we have seen in astronomy, even Colebrook himself said Vedanga, Jyotisha should be dated to 1400 BC. Where is that and where is the 200 BC of uh, linguistic analysis? We have seen Kritika and Shatapatha Brahmana to 2982 BC. Where is that? Where is 600 BC of linguistic analysis? We have seen Rig Vedic stories of Aditi and Ashwinis going to 7200 BC. Where is that and where is the Chandas period of 1000 BC? So clearly, Indian astronomy has got the greatest uh, potential to discredit the linguistic analysis and the dates deriving from there on. It turns out that Max Müller was confronted with this by his fellow Europeans who asked him, should all of Indian chronology be held hostage to the Bible's chronology? He got so upset with that question, he wrote an entire book on that, this on ancient Hindu astronomy. In this book, he tried to explain that all the Indian works are unreliable and he's not able to accept a single date out of that. And he basically discarded all the Indian works. Having set the standard, these are the views that are used even by some Indian scholars today. They blindly take Max Muller's ideas and say Indian astronomy is unreliable. But today we know this is a failed methodology called confirmation bias. So Max Muller had belief system where he believed in the Bible's creation date of 4004 BCE. By his own admission, he believed in that. He also believed from linguistics that Aryans came to India in 1500 BCE. He was okay with Colebrook's date of 1400 BC for Vedanga Jyotisha because that is after the Aryan invasion. So he accepted these things, but he discarded all this evidence that was staring at him as unreliable. So we know that this is confirmation bias. It's evidence of failed methodology in colonial scholarship. By extension, today's academia that uh, exalts Max Muller's views, they're also using a failed methodology to uphold the linguistic analysis.